This podcast is brought to you by Podspot Events. Hello and welcome to the Bondi Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Beattie. The guest in this episode is Alexa Towersey, or Action Alexa, as she's better known as on her Instagram handle. Alexa is a health and fitness coach and a recovering alcoholic. She's been sober for 16 years after seeing alcoholism eventually lead to the death of her father. In this episode, we talk about Alexa's journey from alcoholic to living a sober lifestyle. We also talk about Alexa appearing on the television show Naked and Afraid, which is being aired in May, and about the app that she's just about to launch called Traction. I'd like to thank Alexa for coming on the podcast and being so open and honest about her story. I hope you enjoy this episode. And as always, remember to give us a follow on Instagram at the Bondi Podcast to stay up to date with all of our guests and episodes. Like and subscribe to our YouTube channel and you'll find all of our episodes on Spotify. Cheers. Alexa, welcome to the Bondi Podcast. Thanks for having me. First question we ask all our guests is, what is your favorite thing about Bondi? I had to think long and hard about this, but you know, I want to say the people, but in reality, it's just how many dogs there are out of Pat. <laughs> Don't tell me that. <laughs> we are recording, we're recording in my flat, and I was like, I, I can't have my dog here because oh, you took it, it, would just go, it would just go mad. He would just be jumping on top of you in front of the camera. So he's actually like rounded a neighbor's. I always thought I was an extrovert and then COVID taught me that I was very much an extroverted introvert and I much rather dogs to people for a good majority of the time. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm getting a bit like that. The, the older I get, I'm kind of just happy. It's like me and Alf, to be perfectly honest. 100% in a piece all the way. Yeah. Have you ever had any dogs? I have not actually. I've always owned cats. I've always cuddled dogs and I've always cuddled my friends' dogs, but I've always, yeah, owned cats. So maybe this was always my destiny. Do you Who get, knew? are you like a... Like, are you like anti-Alexa? Do you like, if you know your friends have dogs and they're like, well, if we're going away for the weekend, we'll just leave them with Alexa? If my cat wasn't so terrified of dogs, that would happen all the time. But unfortunately, she's a rescue and she was getting attacked by dogs when she got rescued. So she is terrified. I'm the only person she loves. Oh, poor thing. Yeah, I know. Poor thing. <laughs> hey, um, before we actually get into it, where did, um, where did the nickname Action Alexa come from? That's your Instagram handle, right? It is. You know what? I got asked this the other day and it was way back in Hong Kong and I don't even know what spurred it. I've always done a lot of writing and it came about because I was trying to start writing a blog when I was in Hong Kong and I was trying to find something that went with Alexa and there were these races in Asia called Action Asia. And I was like, well, Action Alexa sounds about right. So there it is, like nothing, nothing dramatic, nothing edgy, nothing wild, no wild story to go with it. Literally, I was trying to write a blog and it... AA seemed to work. AA seemed to work. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> I was just wondering. Uh, yeah, I had no idea. I had no idea, so I was just wondering. Um, look, one of our previous guests, we had Alfie Robertson on the mm. podcast, and he was in talking about his experience during the 75 Hard Challenge. And one of the rules of the 75 Hard Challenge is no alcohol for 75 days. And he said something during the discussion that's like really, really stuck with me. He said... Being sober is a learned skill. And I suppose you're here today, Alexa, to sort of tell us how you've mastered that skill. How long have you been sober for? Well, I have been sober now. It'll be coming up 16 years. Wow. Yeah, a long, long, long time. Um, but best decision I ever made, hands down. Like, changed the course of my life. Like, I have no doubt that if I hadn't stopped drinking, I'd be dead, for sure. What did... Um We'll, we'll get into the, the sober lifestyle and the decision to go sober. What did, what did life look like before you took the decision to go sober? I mean, I want to say I was like a hot mess, but in reality, <laughs> I was probably just a mess. Um, like when, so I started drinking when I was 15. I had my first hip flask of rum when I was 15. I drank the whole thing. I threw up, I got alcohol poisoning, I lied to my parents about it and I was never able to drink rum again. Um, and it continued from when I was 15 through to when I was 29, which is when I quit. Like every weekend, I was a massive, massive, massive binge drinker. Um, and it's funny because even now, like I'm never one to be like, you shouldn't be drinking. I'm always trying to make people aware of why they're drinking because for me, I didn't drink because I liked the taste of alcohol. I drank because I didn't like myself. Why didn't you like yourself? I was 
a pretty shy kid and I was bullied. Um, in my younger years, I was incredibly skinny. My nickname at school was Alexa Anorexa. That's not as good as Alexa Anorexa. <laughs> <laughs> if only the haters could see me flex now. Um, but yeah, and I think drinking was my way of trying to fit in. But, you know, like when I was 15, I think two sort of major things were happening. One, I was being bullied at school. And the second thing was that my mum was diagnosed with manic depression. So I'd go to school and I'd get bullied. I'd come home and my home life was really tumultuous. And because of my mum's sickness, my dad started drinking. So he was basically a high-functioning alcoholic from the time I was 15. And, you know, that's where I learnt to cope with life. Um, and that's what, what I would do in the weekends to sort of get away, but to also sort of feel accepted. And it's funny because at the same time as I started drinking, I also sort of found the gym. So it was kind of like this duality of life. Mm. I would go to the gym during the weekdays and I was around this community of incredibly inspiring people. And the weights room from that point on would become sort of my sanctuary, my safe place. Like the first time I sort of discovered the connection between physical strength and then mental fortitude that came with that. But on the flip side of that and the weekends, I was so desperate to be accepted by my peers that I would go out and get absolutely shit faced. And, you know, when I'm talking drinking, I'm not talking drinking to get happy. I'm talking drinking to the point of like, I would throw up and then start again. I'm talking blackout. I'm talking dangerous situations, not remembering anything the next day, you know, um, to a certain point where even my friends were like, you know, we love you, but it's pretty hard to be your friend when you're drunk and you disappear and you get yourself into these incredibly dangerous situations and we don't know what to do. Um, but it wouldn't be until I was, yeah, like 29 until I sort of had that epiphany and that turning point and made the decision that it sort of had to stop. So talk me through a typical weekend from like Friday hmm. and Sunday. Friday night we would, it would usually be like, because I grew up, so I mean I was born in Scotland christened in Edinburgh Castle, lived in England, Ireland, and Germany until I was 10 because both my parents were British military. So then we moved to New Zealand when I was 10, and then we moved to Gisborne, and I went to Gisborne Girls High. Um, and that's where I had my high school years. And fun story is that it has the highest pregnancy rate in the whole of Australasia. <laughs> <laughs> um and in the weekends, like it was a surfing community. There was nothing else to do but sort of like go to the beach and drink. And all of my crew, all the crew, all the cool crew were out sort of drinking in the weekends. And so Friday night it would begin. We'd go to a house party. Um, there'd either be like, you know, a bunch of surfers there. There'd be, you know, an RSL crowd. Everyone would just go and, you know, get us liquor We'd have fake IDs. We'd go to the local bottle store and come back to someone's house and just sit outside the beach, drink stubbies and get absolutely shit-faced. And I, I think at that point, a lot of my friends were guys. I was never really a girl's girl at school because I was getting bullied by the girls. So I hung out with a lot of the guys and I always wanted to think that I could drink as much as them. And so it was always a competition. Um, and inevitably, I would get really drunk I'd throw up, I'd come back and start again, and then I would wander off drunk and find my way home and then have no recollection of anything that I'd done in the morning. And I assume at that time, you know, you're hanging out with the guys, the guys are probably g and you on, oh, Alex is crazy. 100%. I mean, I, I got on really well with the guys because I was just one of the boys. I mean, and that probably didn't help my situation with the girls, but I think it was because I was so not accepted by that crowd that I really sort of started hanging out more with the sports crowd, more with the guys, you know, I was the girl that was at the barbecue drinking the beers with the boys. Like, and that was kind of, that was my life all the way, pretty much even through uni. Like all of my best mates were the footy boys. You know, some of my best mates while I was growing up were all the guys from the Warriors. And I would go and stay at their house in South Auckland because I played on American football team there through uni and they would come and watch me play. You know, so that was kind of my lifestyle. I was just one of the boys and that's what we did on the weekend. So Friday night and Saturday night, backing it up? Friday night, Saturday night, backing it up and then even like through uni, to put myself through uni, I ended up working on the door at a strip club, like giving out the invisible stamp. <laughs> and of course we got free drinks there. And then I got into bar management and I was pretty much drunk for every shift. Like it was just this pattern, you know, and it was just a habit that was just really normal. And I think back in those days too, like it was really normalized. I think a lot of people now are a little bit more sober curious 
Um, it's become a lot more mainstream to be sober, but there was a lot of pushback if you didn't want to drink back in those days. It was much cooler to drink than not to drink. And I just felt like one of the crew, like that was life. We'd be at, you know, if Friday night was after a sports game, we'd be watching the footy, then Saturday night we're at a rave or at a club and I wouldn't get home until like five or six in the morning and then I'd lie to my parents about where I'd been and what I'd done. And, you know, I even remember I didn't even make it to my high school formal. I got so drunk at the pre-ball um, that I went to sleep under a table. Yeah, and then I got home. God knows how I even got home. And then in the morning, my parents were so angry with me that I lied and told them my drink was spiked because I couldn't face the consequences of what I'd done. Wow. How old yeah. were you then, sorry? And you- I was like 16. Jesus. You know, like it's wild. I look back now and it's like I have two different people. Like I said, I really just didn't like myself. It took me a long time to come to terms with who I was. And I think a lot of the times when people do go out and drink these days, they're not quite sure of who they are or who they want to be. And, you know, drinking makes you invincible. It takes away your boundaries. It takes away all those self-imposed limitations that you have. It takes away any fear. It takes away the shyness. It makes you the person you think you should be. Um, and then people get into that pattern of, I can't be that person that I want to be without the alcohol. 100%. It becomes a crutch, you know. And it's it's funny, like I read this quote once and it's so true. It's like the opposite of addiction isn't sobriety, it's connection. I didn't have that connection early on, really. It was very surface level. So my connection came from drinking and bonding with people over a common love of being drunk. (laughs) Alexa, do you mean connection with others or connection with yourself? I think both. I didn't know who I was. Like, I think when I quit drinking, it gave me a really – good opportunity to get to know exactly who I was and what I wanted Mm. as opposed to hiding behind who I thought I needed to be to fit in. Um, And I think that's probably true of a lot of people who, you know, maybe had a little bit of a tumultuous upbringing and they developed another personality that allowed them to get by and believe that everything was fine. Yeah, absolutely. One thing that comes with sort of drinking in your teenage years and and in your 20s you usually do have a few good stories some nights so you must have a few alexa any of it, any that stick out like you're telling me you're hanging about oh. with the the warriors boys i was like the, i'd be the gatekeeper for those boys like they'd come into the sports <laughs> bar where i'd worked and if i didn't like what was happening or i thought they shouldn't be doing stuff i'd be like right we're going home i'm taking you home it was wild who were the big names in that, in that um film? my best mates um were like wadinga Kopu, um robbie mears and monty Beatham. wow like that was the crowd that i hang out with <laughs> and they were absolute legends um i probably got more stories of their exploits you know and that taught me you don't date footy players <laughs> 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 not that i listen to my own advice but that's something i if i could go back and tell my you know 16 year old self one piece of advice would be like don't do it don't do it to yourself <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah that was like those were kind of like those years mm. just being one of the boys and like my dad's funeral was probably like I was absolutely shit-faced for that. Like that was the last time I ever drank and that's probably one of my wildest stories. Like I drank his last bottle of whiskey. I got up on the bar. I danced on the bar. I fell off the bar. At your dad's funeral? At my dad's, like at the wake. At the wake. And then I was staying in a hotel across the road. I tried to cross the road, fell in a ditch, fell asleep in the ditch, had to get up in the middle of the night, threw up all over my hotel room and miss my flight home the next day. And that was literally, I woke up in the morning and turned to the guy I was dating at the time. I was like, I'm never drinking again. He was like, yeah, yeah, until next time, like until next weekend. And I was like, no, I don't think you understand. Like I'm never drinking again. And I never touched a drop. Like that was the last time. It's, And that's the interesting thing about drinking is that oftentimes you have to have that really rock bottom moment where the consequence of you continuing drinking could be so bad that you don't really have an alternative but to stop. And that's kind of, I think, what happened to me, watching my dad's demise because he actually died from liver cirrhosis as a direct consequence of being an alcoholic. And I watched that heartbreaking journey. And then going to his funeral and realizing that I had behaved so poorly and I was so embarrassed that all my dad's friends 
would see what I'd become, you know, and that I was following in his footsteps, that that was kind of like the, oh, my God, if I go down this path, like I'm going to end up killing myself like he did. Yeah, like the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. It really doesn't, Yeah, you know, and yeah. That, like that's one thing I wanted to touch on, Alexa, is that that relationship with your father. Um, obviously, there has, there has been a lot of studies done on whether alcoholism runs in families and where, whether certain people are genetically predispositioned to becoming more susceptible to alcoholism. Mm. It sounds like, obviously, you know, your dad started drinking a lot and it led to his eventual death. Is that something you've, you've looked into? 100%. I actually did a paper on it at uni, like the predisposition towards addictive behavior. So you did this at, what, the age of 18, 19? 18, 19, and I went still... to uni, yep. And Because you've you oh, seen it in front of you, or? I No, I mean, like, I was well aware of it. But being aware of it doesn't necessarily mean that you have the tools yet to put into place to make a change. You know, like, I went through years of knowing what I was doing was absolutely probably killing me and putting me down a really dark and dangerous path, and still I didn't stop. You know, I had friends telling me um, that I was going down a dark and dangerous path, and it still took the death of my dad. And I think that's the problem with addiction is you can't guilt someone out of it. You can't shame them out of it. You can't force them out of it. You can't even love them out of it. You have to let them come to terms with what's happening for themselves. And when they're ready to change, they'll change, you know? And it's funny because I get asked all the time, like, how did you know it was the right time to stop? And I was like, I don't know. I just did. It came to a point where I was like, I have to quit or these are the consequences. And oftentimes the consequences for people aren't bad enough that they are forced to make a change. And I don't think up until, you know, everything sort of started happening around the time that my dad got really sick from liver cirrhosis, like my job, my boss noticed that I was drinking more and more. My friends were starting to notice my partner at the time, you know, was like, we can't be out together drunk Um, because it just doesn't work and then to have the dad on top of that it was like all of these things leading up to a certain point but it took so many bad things happening before I realized I had to make a change like I when I worked at the bar I put myself in the hospital you know I'd get so drunk I'd get in a cab I had no idea how I would get home but one time I actually fell out of the cab smacked my head on the curb Um, and knocked myself out and two people passing by found me on the grass verge, put me in an ambulance and I woke up in hospital on a drip. You know, like I would end up in situations like that all the time, like if not every weekend, every second weekend and still it would take me, you know, seven or eight years after having an experience, like seven or eight years of having those experiences time and time again before I was at a point where I felt ready to make the change. Yeah. We've had a, one of our previous guests say that your, your why just has to be big enough. 100% it does. You have, you have to know why you're stopping because inevitably there are going to be times when you're out and people are like, why aren't you drinking? Or just have one or how come you're not fun? Like, that's no fun. Just have one for the road. Like, what harm is that going to do? It's like, you don't understand. If I have one, that one's going to turn into three and that one's going to turn into seven. And we're going to be doing shots. And then, and then, <laughs> and then it's all over. <laughs> yeah. And then they'll be dancing on the table and the naked seal in the corner. Yeah, yeah so <laughs> yeah, Exactly. So it's, yeah, it was just, it was just wild. Like I remember being in Japan because I lived in Japan for six months and I think that was probably my craziest month, my craziest months. And I nearly got arrested for slapping a taxi driver because I was so irate that he couldn't figure out where I lived. I stole a bike outside the Russian embassy and got chased by police through alleyways because I was so drunk I kept falling off in front of them. I thought I couldn't get out of a bathroom stall in a club and I kicked the door down. Like, Action Alexa style, bang. I'm, like, who am I? You know, it was, I look back now and I'm like mortified at yeah. my behavior. But in saying that, it gave me some really cool stories. Yeah. And it definitely gave me the knowledge that I had to quit at some point, you know, like, and it's, I tell these stories now and people can relate. It's scary how many people can relate to these dark and dangerous things that I was doing. It's like, it's so normalized. Um, but yeah, it's, it was the best thing I ever did for myself for sure. So just, um, just circling back actually mm. on the, on the paper you wrote in uni, what were sort of the findings from that paper in terms of like alcoholism and families and 
Genetics. There was a genetic predisposition towards addiction, and then that was often expressed by something that happened in the family or what that happened in your environment. So there was a combination of nature and nurture. Mm. Um, and my, so my dad was an alcoholic. My dad's dad was an alcoholic. My dad's brother was an alcoholic. So for me, I knew that alcoholism ran in my family. So you're kind of like, you're fighting that nature. <laughs> you know, you're fighting the genetic predisposition to go down that route. And it probably, it expresses now in my perfectionism towards my career, that addictive behavior to get something right or to be all or nothing. You know, and I think a lot of high performers have that inherent nature. That is why they're high performers because they can circle in and go down that route um, and be very, very hyper focused on it. It's the same with addiction. Um, but yeah, I'm just yeah, yeah. Addicts can be addicted to something healthy or unhealthy. They can be like, and that's the same thing with exercise. Like I remember when I quit, I initially replaced one addiction with another. I through the course of my career, I'd started working like I was getting out of bars. I met a boy in Hong Kong. He owned a mixed martial arts gym over there. He was like, look, I think you should try and get out of the whole bar scene. Um, why don't you? a good idea. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, you were drinking and working PR. Because I got to a point where I was like, I knew there was a problem when I started looking forward to my first drink. You know, like I'd never envisioned myself as an alcoholic. I don't think I'd ever, I'd been like, I'm a binge drinker. There's a difference between being an alcoholic, like my dad was where you drank every day, you drank by yourself. Um, it didn't matter what time of day it was, you know, like that was what an alcoholic did. They drank all the time. Whereas I was like, I just go out and get really shit faced in the weekends. There's a difference. So were you fine during the week? Like, So when I went to Hong Kong, I was doing the PR and marketing for three bars. And because I was in that environment all the time, I found myself starting to drink at 5 p.m. when I'd had my first meeting all the way through to 3 a.m. because I had a bar tab and I was out with all of my mates and I could get all of my mates free drinks. So it was just this vicious cycle. And I remember one day thinking, oh, my God, I'm so hungover. I can't wait until I have my meeting at 3 o'clock in the afternoon because I can have my first glass of wine. I was like, you have a problem. Mm. And I think that was the first time I really realized that it was a big problem because it had moved out of binge drinking in the weekends to, holy shit, it's a Tuesday night and I'm looking forward to having a meeting so I can have a glass of wine and start my drunken journey for the night because this is how I'm going to get through my job. This is how I'm going to interact with people. This is how I'm going to deal with myself and all the things I don't really like about my life. Yeah, It was just that complete escapism. Um, so he had noticed that I was drinking more and more and he was like, this isn't really going to work. Why don't you get out of the bar scene? Why don't you come and work for me at the gym? And that kind of helped me break the cycle. And during the course of that, I met a girl who ended up being sort of a bit of a friend, a bit of a mentor, and she'd been sober for four years. And she'd been through drug and rehabilitation since like her parents had actually sent her there. She was a bit of a wild child. And I remember one day, like, I'd been, you know, you inevitably go through phases, like it's the, you know, the dry July or whatever, you go through phase of like, right, I'm not going to drink for a month. And then you reward yourself by getting really drunk, you know, and you go through all these phases all the time. And I remember I'd done a particularly long stint and drinking had always been a coping mechanism, like an outlet for me. And I remember just being really frustrated and really angry and having all these emotions that I didn't really know what to do with and I pulled her aside one day and I was like how do you do this how do you deal with the emotion like how do you get it out and she's like you have to find something bigger than yourself you have to find something else to focus on so that this isn't the thing that you're thinking about all the time you're not focused on it and she was like my husband and I we're gonna go and do a triathlon do you want to come to triathlon club I was like sure <laughs> hate swimming, but I'll come to triathlon <laughs> club. And I ended up falling in love with the sport. And the triathlon, what triathlon gave me ultimately was it gave me something to do on the weekends where I wasn't sitting at home by myself with FOMO while everybody else, including my partner, was out getting drunk. It gave me something to focus on where I could perform really well and that I was good at. And it gave me this entirely new community that some of them had also gone into triathlon for the very same reason. And so they 
they got it. They understood why I was there. They wanted to support what it was that I was trying to do. And it gave me that social circle that, you know, supported my life choices that weren't confronted by it. Because honestly, like even to this day, sometimes I'm still surprised by how many people find it confronting when you tell them you don't drink because you're indirectly challenging their own lifestyle choices. You're reflecting them back at themselves and they don't like that. People don't like that. They don't like it. And so I lost, like for lack of a better term, it was almost like social suicide for me when I stopped. So finding this triathlon club gave me, like it filled the void. And I got so good at it. It took me two and a half years. I hired a coach. I decided to compete um, on a bigger level. And in two and a half years, I ended up switching to half Ironman and then qualifying for world champs. And in that two and a half years, while I'd initially swapped being drunk as an addiction, I guess, to exercise as an addiction, by the end of the two and a half years, I found that I didn't need either. And so, yeah, while I initially replaced one addiction with another, I ended up finding myself at the end and being so much stronger for it that I was finally ready by the time dad passed away. I was ready to, you know, I was. How did you go at the world champs? I didn't go. I decided not to go. It was going to be a massive undertaking. Like I was living in Hong Kong. It was in Las Vegas and I just didn't have the money to go. But all I wanted to do was get the qualifying berth. Amazing. So, yeah. So, Alexi, you were, but you were still open to drinking during this period of time? Like with- Half Iron Man? No. But right. you had a drink after the Half Iron Man? Was that your dad's funeral? I had, I think I had one other drink after that and then that was it. Okay. Yeah. So, no. It's like Half Iron Man gave me... It just gave me the tools and the confidence to know that I could be better than what I was. And then at the end of that, it was like, I don't need to drink at all. Amazing. And it just showed me that I didn't like, by that stage, it had been sort of two and a half years and I was like, okay. And now it's funny because you go out and people are like, well, just have one for the road. And you're like, do you seriously think I'm going to give up 15 years of sobriety because you think it would be fun for me to have one? Like it's, you're so strong in your convictions that it just doesn't matter. Yeah. Completely yeah. agree. Hmm. Alexa, I want to delve delve down into um, that sort of time in your life where you actually took the decision to stop drinking. You said it was in and around the time of your your dad's your mm. dad's funeral. You brushed over it a little bit, but just a little bit more, if you can, about where your headspace was at and the actual decision to quit and the sort of initial reaction you got from the people around you. The initial reaction, I think, like I remember when I was at work, I won the award one Christmas party for being the person that came to work every Monday and being like, I'm never drinking again. So when they did this question at the Christmas party and they were like, who's the person that comes to work on Monday and says they're never drinking again? Everyone was like, Alexa. (laughs) It's like, that's mortifying. Now that's who I'm known as. Mm. Um, So when I quit, I think most people thought it was going to be a fad and Like in Hong Kong, I don't know if you've ever been there, but it is wild. You can do anything you want at any hour of the day. Like doesn't matter where you are. Like it's the craziest place I've ever lived in my life. It's not conducive to a sober lifestyle. Like it's not conducive (laughs) to a sober lifestyle. I've only seen the footage from the Hong Kong sevens. Like that's (laughs) that's about it. You can pretty much do that. So it's like that all the time. It's like that all the time. Like you can go, wherever you go, you could do whatever you wanted to do. There's always people out. Um, It's not conducive to being sober at all. And when I quit initially, like I couldn't go out for six months because I really wasn't strong enough in my beliefs. I was really scared that I was going to go out. I was going to feel uncomfortable. Um, I was going to see somebody that was drunk and then I would feel pressured to do it. Or I would be like, oh, I really miss this. I want the connection. I miss the feeling of being drunk. Just one. I'll just have one and then I'll go home. And I was so terrified that I would give up on myself, that I wouldn't be strong enough to do it, that I just couldn't go out for six months um and then by that six months I stopped being invited to things because people are like oh she's no longer the fun one what do we talk to her about we're going to get drink this is going to be really we're going to get drunk this is going to be really uncomfortable what's she going to do while we're there um you know it's amazing all the people I initially met, we bonded over while we were drinking. So you take away the drink and we really didn't have any commonalities, um, including my partner. We met out while we were both drunk and 
we love to go out, you know, we'd always be out drinking. And I think that's how we initially bonded. And I, when I stopped drinking and he wanted to go out on the weekends, you know, I wanted to hang out on a Sunday because it was the one day off we had together and, and he was hung over. Yeah. And that was kind of like, I think that was sort of the beginning of the end of us. So I lost entire groups of friends because they didn't know what to do with me anymore and because it was quite, if some of them realized that potentially they had a problem, they didn't want to look at me and have me challenge what they were doing or, you know, I wouldn't even have to say anything. I'm the least, I'm the least judgy person you'll ever meet. But I think just by having me there, they're like, okay, she did it. I don't want to do it. I'm not ready to go down that path yet. And it was just really confronting for them. Um, but yeah, my partner would just go out all weekend and he was happy doing that. You know, we'd cross paths. There was this one place in Hong Kong that was open 24-7, this breakfast place. And he would come in from being really drunk at like 4 a.m. in the morning and I was there having breakfast with my triathlon gear on and my little padded pants <laughs> with my bike parked outside and we'd meet up for a quick like breakfast. And I like I started getting the ick, the ick. because yeah. I was like, oh, my God, this is what I looked like drunk. This is horrific. I don't want to be this person. Like I don't want to be seen with this person. This is awful. Um, and it just got to a point where we just really had nothing in common because he wanted to go out drinking the weekends and I didn't. And that was, yeah, the beginning of the end. Wow. Mm. So before you came on, Alexa, I, I've, I've not had a drink in a while now and I counted up the days, um, uh, cause I knew we were having this conversation hmm. tonight, 140 days, uh, 147 days, uh, without, without a drink. Um, one of the things I'm finding certainly the hardest is, um, is the social side and it's sort of what what you're talking about is sort of being in between friend groups yeah nearly it get what the, the situation i find myself in quite a lot at the minute is it gets to like five or six p.m on a saturday night and like the phone's not gone or you're kind of sitting there going well you know if this group of people are out at the pub but you don't necessarily want to go and be that sober person did you, you've touched on it a little bit mm. there. What advice would you give to someone who's maybe in that, in, in that position? Cause you've, you've been through it in those early days of sobriety as well. That sort of. I think it really does. I mean, I was lucky with triathlon in that I ended up with an entirely new community. And I think once you make the decision to do something, you do like, I don't want to be all woo-woo and say that your energy aligns and you start attracting other no, people no, into I, your I life that yeah. do it. But you kind of do, like you start bumping into people that are more aligned with your values. And I think it teaches you to be a little bit more open-minded and explore outside your regular community. Um, you know, I'd say go and get a hobby that, like even if it's like a hiking group or a running group. Start a podcast. Start a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> you know, where you meet other people who have similar yeah. interests to you. Like for me, I love it now that I've got endurance riding. So every second or third weekend, I'm away competing at horse rides in the country and I have an entirely new community and I don't even think about being out. And my cup is so full that I don't miss it. So it's really about allowing yourself to be open to meeting people who are outside of what is normally comfortable for you. Um, I go to movies by myself, like, and get, you've really got to learn to enjoy your own company. You know, like one of the biggest piece of advice, like when I first came to Sydney and I was a little bit lonely because I moved here by myself, I didn't really know anyone. And I'd, you know, come off a little bit of a dating disaster. And I remember going to see an energy healer, like someone had recommend this energy healer. It wouldn't be something that I would normally do. And she was like, you know, you've got to get comfortable with yourself. You have to like yourself. Like what is something that you could learn to do at home that you would really enjoy that would encourage you to spend time with yourself? And it was right before Easter weekend. And I was like, you know what? I've always wanted to learn how to play the guitar. So I was like, right. I walked into Bondi Junction. I was like, if I go into Bondi Junction, and I can find a music shop that sells guitar and they can give me a lesson on the same day, I'm going to buy a guitar. And I walked into a music shop. They gave me a lesson at 3 p.m. that day and I bought the guitar. And I swear to God, I got back to the apartment and I did not stop playing that guitar the entire weekend. And all I learned was smoke on the water. But literally that was it. I'd never even heard of that song before I started playing the guitar. And I did not even think about what other people were doing. I was just so focused on this thing. And 
over that time, like I've just, I love hanging out by myself. Uh, my life, you know, I've learned to seek out things. And this is my biggest piece of advice when it comes to mental health as well. It's like write a list of all the things in life that make you happy or bring you joy. And that could be like getting a coffee and doing the sunrise walk. It could be walking your dog. It could be ringing a friend that makes you feel really good about yourself. It could be doing your five-minute meditation in the morning. Anything in life that brings you joy or makes you happy and commit to doing it once a day. And once I started doing that for myself and I started figuring out all the things that made me happy that didn't involve anybody else's external validation or didn't involve anybody else coming to the party I could just do it all by myself happy life mm. you know and that's when you realize that you really are capable of sitting with yourself and if people ask me now like do you like yourself absolutely because I've learned to I've had to learn to do you remember that moment where you realized oh I actually do quite like myself yeah talk me through that it was it was actually right after the guitar actually and I just found myself after guitar, like humming music and like listening to music. I, I'd never really been into music, like not even when I trained at the gym. And I just found myself listening more and more to music. And I'd be walking somewhere and I'd put something on and I would just be instantly upbeat. And then I'd get home and I'd be thinking, do I need to ring so and so? I'd be like, no, I'm quite happy sitting here. And I'd get to the end of like another couple of days and I'd be like, oh my God. I didn't call one person having to catch up with them. I was like, this could be dangerous. And, you know, I'm still here by myself, like however many years later. But it's just that realization that, you know, you're sitting there in your home and you're perfectly happy just with maybe, you know, some pizza and some ice cream and some trashy <laughs> reality TV and you don't need anything else, you know. And I think once you've it's like anything else. You have to cultivate that. Like it's a conscious choice. I didn't wake up one day and be like, oh, this is what I'm doing now. It's, it's a slow burn. It is. Every day you wake up and you're like, who do I want to be? How do I be that person? And none of it involves alcohol. And when you've gone long enough and you realize who you are, it's just you don't really ever think about going back or I don't like I don't miss anything about drinking like nothing and I think that's what it comes down to you know like people are always so focused on what they're losing by not doing something instead of all of the things that they're gaining but it's just such a beautiful day when you wake up and you realize that you've lost absolutely nothing at all to hangover or they're feeling a bit dusty. Yeah, yeah, I don't miss that at all. I'm such a fan. Alexa, I do it myself. The, you talked about making a list of all mm. the things you love doing. So I do it from time to time. I'll, I'll make a list of all the things I, lo I love doing. Go through them one by one and go, is this in my life on a regular basis? And then just adjust accordingly. If it's not on it, then you ask yourself, why is that? Why am I not doing more of this? And then just adjust your day or your week or your month accordingly to make sure you're you're, you're taking off all those things. Yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? And like you often, you'll find too that like I started noticing the more, the more I was really happy with what I was doing, the more, I guess, of a good vibe I was giving off. And 100%. then I started attracting into my life really good people um, who were on the same wavelength. And these were really unexpected people. Like I'd meet someone and I would have no idea that they'd, been through an experience similar to mine and all of a sudden there they are being like oh yeah I've been sober for whatever I'm like oh my god who would think you know and I just met a bunch of people and now like you know the, the people I have around me now we could go out to three in the morning but they'd be at the bar getting me a diet coke or a glass of water before I've even had to ask for it you know yeah it's more and it's normal really, now. oh it's so much more normal now yeah. um I went to a rave a couple of weeks ago my friend was over um uh, over from Belfast and he was sort of he's a DJ and he was touring Australia and he didn't come on till half past 12 and he was playing till half past two and I just was on the heaps normal <laughs> the entire time but was on the dance floor the entire time as well oh company makes such a big difference yeah like your community makes all the difference and that's like whenever you're talking about people you know it comes back to that whole addiction you know the opposite isn't sobriety it's connection it is you have to find that group of people that really want the best for you, you know, that don't ever feel challenged by your own lifestyle choices, that just want you to be the best, most happy version of yourself. And those are the people that you keep around. If anyone detracts from that, um, 
you know, you probably need to reassess. Let go. Yeah, 100%. And like, you often find, like, I just find that the people that weren't aligned with what I wanted to do, there they was no big away. conversation. They do. They yeah. just, they drift out of your orbit. Yeah. And you meet a bunch of people who want to do fun stuff. Like now all the people I hang out with want to go out taking the weights fist out hiking the weekend. They want to go out riding. They want to go on crazy adventures, you know, and they're really inspired by all of that stuff. And the other people, I don't really see them. Yeah. You know? They drift out. They drift out. There's and no big conversation. There's no room. confrontation. Yeah. You make room for other people. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it's funny. I'll see those same people out now and they'll all want to tell me, oh, I need to get back to the gym. And I'm like, you don't have to tell me you want to get back to the gym. <laughs> you can do what you need to do. Yeah, there's no judgment. It's just, you know, you'll figure it out in your own time and you need to do what's right for you. Just, you know, it's not about not drinking ever. Like I would never tell anyone that, but just be aware of why you're drinking in the first place because that's the thing that probably needs to be addressed more often. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. And um, we sort of talked there a little bit about the, the those initial days mm. of making the decision to go sober you've been sober for quite a long time now yeah what are like you know maybe two or three of the key benefits you've noticed alexa like across the, the board yeah across the board to to uh, like stop drinking like i used to have like sundays for me we i call them self-loathing sundays because i would absolutely hate myself I mean, there, like, if, yeah. <laughs> if you think about how many times you've woken up not feeling the best and then you've got that sick feeling in the pit of your stomach because you're like, what did I say last night? Did I tell somebody's secret? Did I say something really offensive? Did I kiss somebody's boyfriend? Did I give my number out to someone who's not my partner? You know what I mean? You've got so did no all idea. these things happen? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I did all the things <laughs> and then I realized all the things weren't great. Um, you know, I don't miss that. I don't miss hangovers. You know, essentially, I think what people forget, and I go back to this whole dry July, I'm always surprised because every time dry July comes around, I always read these posts that go up and they're always like, I've noticed all of these improvements in my life. I'm so much happier. I'm so much more productive. My skin's clearer. My eyes are clearer. Um, I've met all my goals. I've done all the, all the things I said I was going to do. And we're going to have a party this weekend and we're going to celebrate by getting really fucked up. Do you want to come? And you're like, you just did this amazing thing and you've just finished telling me how awesome you felt sober. And now you want to go out and essentially poison yourself and not feel great about it. And that's the celebration. Like you're going to celebrate by poisoning yourself. And I just don't get it. I'm like, you've just taught yourself exactly how awesome it is to have the sober life. Why do you want to go back? Why do they? I think for a lot of people, it's the connection because they're still in that circle of friends that that is still the norm. And until you figure out what else it is that makes you happy and what else it is that makes you feel connected, you're probably going to be still stuck in that circle. Like I said, the change has to be, it has to come from a place that if you don't change the consequences are going to be so bad that you have no other alternative. Um, and a lot of people don't get to that point. It's scary. It is scary. But look, there's not, you know, there is not one area of my life, like every single area of my life. I have no doubt that had I continued drinking, one, you know, like I would probably have gone down the route that my dad went down and I would have ended up dead. And if not, I definitely wouldn't be living the life that I live now. Like it would be very, very different. I think the moment I quit drinking was the moment everything changed. Mm. Amazing. Yeah. Um, Alex, I'm going to change lane here slightly. Uh, I know you've done some reality TV. Recently. Ah. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure how much you can s tell us about that. Naked and Afraid, what is Naked yeah. and Afraid? Naked and Afraid is essentially a guy and a girl I uh, get dumped out in a really unforgiving landscape, could be anywhere in the world, with no clothes, no food, no shelter, no fire, no water. And you had to say where you got dumped? Um, I got dumped in Colombia. Right. <laughs> <laughs> in the jungle. Um, it's going to be out on May the 5th and then there'll be a party. Um, it was, yeah, for 21 days you have to survive. Just you and this guy? Just me and a guy. And you're naked, like no clothes at all. So... Can you tell us anything more than that at the minute? What or can no? I tell you? Look, it's out there now. Um, I was out there with a an Amish guy. Good combination. You'll see a lot of eye rolling. Um, from I didn't him know or if you? you from me. My eye roll was legendary. Um, 
I tell you what, like it was one of the most epic yet awful experiences of my life, but I'm so glad I did it because one, the first thing anybody ever asked me about the show is that you're naked. Like, how did you deal with that? And especially being somebody who's on social media, who's always like, I, you know, I developed my business and my brand off the back of an aesthetic and you are essentially like first and foremost, they're like, how are you naked in front of these people? Like you're in front of a whole crew, you're naked in front of your partner. You know, how did you feel about that? Given like, were you self-conscious at all? And I think with a show like this, even though you probably won't get it until you see it, it's like the being naked part is the least interesting thing about the show. And you forget about it so quickly because you have bigger fish to fry. And for me, it became a really good opportunity to take the emphasis off what I looked like and put it on what I could do. And that was kind of cool, especially being a woman in her 40s. All of a sudden, you're, you know, there's no Photoshop or filter out in the jungle. Um, I had to put on weight to go out there because I was very well aware that I was going to be out there for 21 days, potentially with no food. Um, I won't tell you how much I lost, but it was a lot. But I had this conversation with myself. It was a really uncomfortable process of putting on a bunch of weight for it. And I was like, at the end of the day, if I have to quit, or tap out because of my physique, because I was too lean, because I was scared to put on weight, I would never forgive myself. That's ridiculous. And so I ended up putting on a bunch of weight and going out there and yeah, it worked in my favor is all I will say about that. But um, it taught me so much about myself and I'm such a fan of going after experiences that make you really uncomfortable. And I don't just mean like doing things that make you uncomfortable within your comfort zone. I mean taking you well out of your comfort zone and trying to learn a completely new skill set. So is that the driver behind doing the show, Alexa? Absolutely. Like I – so. It would have been a year to the day I interviewed a friend of mine who's a professional survivalist on, um, I did an interview with her and I was like, what is, she used to be a professional, she was a stunt woman, she won awards in Hollywood. And I was like, what is the one thing that you've done in your life that um, you were really scared of and you were terrified that you were going to quit? And she told me about this experience where she'd done 21 days in the Amazon by herself and On her extraction day, she had to basically build this raft out of three trees when she'd eaten six monkey nuts in 21 days. And she was bleeding into piranha-infested waters and she had to paddle upstream on this submerged raft and a caiman went under the raft and she kept going for four hours. She was like, can I do one more stroke? Yes, I can. Can I do one more stroke? Yes, I can. And she got herself out. And I remember listening to the story and thinking, man, there's just so much badassery in that story. I want some of that. And I said to her, like, if you ever have a situation where – You need people to do that. You need people or a mentor mentee situation. I'm going to put my hand up. And it was almost a year to the day she messaged me and was like, is your hand still up? And I was like, absolutely. What do I have to do? And she taught me how to use a ferro rod. I don't have any survival skills. She taught me how to use a ferro rod. So that's something you make fire with over Zoom. And I was doing it over my oven in Pondi, (laughs) like learning how to make fire. And that was the only thing I'd ever done. So a month beforehand, I built my first shelter, zero survival skills. I was like, you know what? All of my life has taught me that I know like survival is about solving problems. It's about adapting and overcoming. And if that's what I have to do when I get out there, wing it and figure out a way to survive, then I'll do it. And if I have to, you know, sit there and suffer, then I'll do that too. Because if there's one thing that I know of like the 40 years of my existence, it's that I might not be the fittest or the fastest or the strongest in a room, but I'm very, very good at suffering. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit sadistic. Oh, right? yeah. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what was that? What was the toughest thing about it? Um, probably the fact that my partner and I didn't get on. Oh, really? Yeah. I um, There was a lot of conflict management and you are, you know, it's, personalities, you know, you find out who somebody is at the very worst of times. Like anybody can be a great human in good conditions when life is going well, but who are you when the shit hits the fan? Um, And 
my partner and I were very, very different people and managing two very, very different personalities in an incredibly stressful situation where you can't escape the conflict, that was very difficult for me. So the producers have done that on purpose, obviously. 100%. (laughs) You put an Amish guy where it's like in a community where women should be seen and not heard. Why the fuck's he on the show in the first place? With, he, well, he's got an incredible backstory as well, but yeah, he essentially ran away from an Amish community at 17. So he wanted to prove, I guess, that he could still do it. Um, But with a female who has opinions, who is strong, who is independent, who is everything that females probably aren't in a community like that. Challenges perception, right? Yeah. yeah, you put the two together. I mean, they're very, very good at what they do. And it made for some great TV. <laughs> oh, I can't wait to see it, Alexa. <laughs> yeah, it'll be wild. Amazing. It'll be wild. Amazing. That's great. Would you do it again? I would, actually. I mean, I lost half of my hair when I came back. I've still got all the scars around my ankles from the bugs that absolutely ate me alive. And there was festering sores on festering sores on festering sores. Sexy. Yeah, I'm hot. <laughs> um but yeah, like I, like I said, I'm such a fan of putting myself in those positions because I feel like so many people go through life not understanding their potential. And again, so many people have been like, I could never do that. And I'm like, you could because you really don't have any idea of what you're capable of doing until you have to be capable of doing it. And that was what I learned. Like I exceeded all of my own expectations in a situation like that. And that's phenomenal. I mean, how often do you get to say that you did that? You know? Yeah. Going really out of your comfort zone. Wow. Well out of there. Yeah. (laughs) Bloody hell. Um, Alexa, what does life look like today? It's brilliant. I love my life. Yeah? Yeah. Talk, Talk me through a typical week. God, I live, I mean, obviously I live in one of the greatest places in the world. I have a cat that absolutely adores me. I get to see rural Australia when I go and ride horses every second or third weekend. Um, I don't ever have any dusty Sunday mornings. I have an incredibly inspiring group of females that I count as some of my best friends. And my cup is full. You know, I'm in a position now where everything I do is to bring me peace. And I'm like, I can honestly say that I'm truly happy. It's like an incredible story, like up to this point. What's next? (sighs) I'm launching my app. And then honestly, I just want to launch my app so I can move out of Bondi, move to the country and become a horse trainer. Tell us about the app. (laughs) (laughs) Um, The app's called Traction. um, And it's basically going to be a combination of training, nutrition and all of the mental health kind of like bite-sized um piece of advice that I've had over the years that have really helped me get to the place that I'm at now and that I hope will help somebody else like I have such you know I've got 40 years of anecdotes um of life experience lessons lessons yeah. that you know whatever you learn you get to teach and that's kind of what this app is about like when I had my hip replacement it taught me a bunch of stuff about training um it taught me a bunch of stuff about life and about being injured and about being resilient and this app It's kind of all about that, hence the name, Traction. It's kind of just about, you know, giving you or pulling you in the direction that you want to go, um, pulling you in the direction of your goals. So, yeah. Amazing. And you're launching that next week. How are you feeling about that? Oh, don't even (laughs) start. I've had rage. (laughs) (laughs) My brain is dead. Like My brain is so dead. Um, I'm really, look, I'm really proud because it's something I've done for myself and I, I feel like I can totally empathize and be really proud of all the other entrepreneurs out there that have started their own business and gone their own way and done their own thing because the amount of work, especially when you're a perfectionist, is just huge. And I don't think anyone really understands all the back-end stuff. Like it's really easy to have a successful product, but no one sees the years of hard work and education and sweat and tears that go into making a business by yourself and you know at the end of it it's just going to be one of those things where I get to take off and be like I did this all by myself and I'm really fucking proud another thing to add to the list yeah I know I can't my (laughs) list is too full man I need to stop (laughs) oh amazing um look Alex I've got two more questions uh this evening it's Mm. been such a good discussion so thank you for coming on and being like so so open and honest and candid 
first question, what advice would you give to someone who's maybe thinking about going sober, even just for a little bit? They're, what, would, what did you, how did you describe it earlier? Sober curious? Yes, sober curious. Um, what advice would you give to someone who's currently sort of sober thinking curious? Thinking about it? Yeah. Try it. I think with anything, you have to try it to see how you feel because you won't know how amazing you'll feel until you actually give it a red hot crack, you know, and when you're in it, like start keeping a mood journal if you need to, you know, of how amazing you feel or, you know, even a daily gratitude about something that alcohol has given you back, you know, don't think about the things that you're losing. Think about all the things that you could be gaining by trying a new way of life. At the end of the day, like I think everyone thinks when they commit to something that a goal is for life, at any point in time, your goal gets to change. You're not stuck on it. It's not a lifetime contract, but you'll never know unless you try. And I promise you there's like a whole new world out there. Mm. Would you recommend like a minimum time to give it a crack? Look, I think, I mean, what they say is like it takes three weeks to build a habit. Yeah. Um, Give yourself like three or four weeks to actually give it, you know, give it a go and challenge your mates to do it with you. You know, it really does. The people you have around you matter. You know, you are who you hang with. And if you are hanging out with people that never allow you to realize your potential, like that's just a really sad thing. So, yeah, I mean, there's there's no real advice. Like it's everyone's different in the timing of their life. Everyone has different goals and aspirations, but the only way you're ever going to know if something works for you is to try it, you know? Um, if 75 hard is a thing or signing up to a challenge or doing a dry July or a Feb fast or whatever it is, if that's the thing that gets you to commit and have accountability, awesome. But if it's something you've been sitting on the fence for a while about, you know, just make that commitment to yourself and start writing down all the good things that it gives you. Beautiful. Hmm. and then final question alexa if i can take you back to i think it was the morning after your dad's funeral yep what words of advice or what would you say to that version of alexa on that day or on that morning as long as you are your authentic self you'll end up with the right people around you that's a beautiful place to leave it, alexa i think so Thank you so much for coming on for a chat, You're mate. So really welcome. appreciate it. Thank you. Sweet as. Thank you for having me. Cheers. <laughs>